Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I want to get down on my knees and pray I need God. Anybody ready for God's Word today? Come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. And uh, let's ask God to be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're grateful people as we come before you, Lord, and we're just thankful that the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Lord, as you bless us, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, mm -mm, yours. And God will give you the praise. Jesus, mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Take your Bible, go with me, if you will, into Hebrews, the ninth chapter. You know, a lot of times we're in such a hurry to get through things, especially in America, that we're always wanting to move past something into something else. And recently at our pastoral staff meeting, I made a statement to everybody. I said, this weekend, I'm going to take us to the 10th chapter. I'm going to just kind of overview the 9th chapter and put it behind us because I don't want anybody to get bored. You know, we've been talking about sacrifice, the blood, blood and sacrifice, sacrifice, blood, blood and sacrifice. Uh, and, and, and I didn't want anybody to get bored. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, don't call what I have called glorious and eternal boring. I have written it there for a reason. And God's emphasis in the scripture should be something we pay high attention to because it's in the emphasis that his heart is revealed and his love is shown. And sometimes what we want to do is we want to get past something quickly and move on when in fact it's so good you don't want to go too fast. Very seldom in an American church do you hear people preach very often from the Hebrew text from especially chapter 6 through chapter 9. Very seldom will you ever hear that. You're some of the people here because most of the time people don't believe you can handle it. But I believe you can handle it and certainly God wrote it that way so that you can handle it and it's going to be absolutely exciting. Before I even give you the title of the message, may I just read you the verse. God has taken me back all the way to the 14th verse where we left off last time with Pastor Luke. And it says this, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through, if you will, eternal spirit. And I love this. Remember last week, Pastor Luke showed us the depth of his, of his love. How much more offered himself without spot to God. Didn't have to do that. Could have walked away. Could have left. He was a king of glory. He's, a, he's the, uh, uh, the, the one who created it all and holds it all together by his might. But offers himself because he loves you so much. And he loves me so much. The depth of his love is absolutely overwhelming that he would care about. Now someone who loves you and loves me that much has got to have a plan for my life. And that's what's being revealed here in the scripture. The last part of that verse goes on and says, cleanses your conscience. And I read that, and I, we talked about the blood cleansing us, and, but cleansing our conscience was such an important thing. It just jumped out at all of us. You know, if you ask a half a dozen people what the word conscience means, you'll get about a half a dozen different answers. But let me define for you what conscience means. Conscience is such an interesting word. And I'll put it up on the overhead so that you can even see it. Conscience, the sense to evaluate right and wrong. 
And all of a sudden, when you get saved, you have the ability to senses to evaluate not only right and wrong, but what is God and what isn't God. What is good and what is evil. And this sense that's on the inside of us to evaluate that particular position that we're in is vitally important to us. And God said that he has cleansed our conscience with the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, with that sacrificial act of Jesus Christ. He has done something for a reason. That he has cleansed our thinking process so that we can properly adapt to that which is God and that which isn't God. Are you following me? For an example, I gave you the illustration, if you'll remember, a couple of weeks back about the pig. I don't know if any of you remember that or not. You can take a pig out and you can clean him and wash him down, clean his little snout out and shine and hooves. You can polish his hooves. You can even put fingernail polish on his hooves and get him so clean and clean all of the, of the pig so he smells good, put perfume on the pig. But because the pig is a pig, when you let him go, he's going to run right back into the what? Mud. And that's where he's comfortable in the mud. So here it is that God has cleansed our conscience, this ability to sense what is good and what is evil, what is of God and not of God, so that when he cleanses our bodies, that we can now have an insight on how to live. The pig doesn't know anything but being a pig. So naturally for it, it's going to run back to the, the slop, back to the pigsty, back to the mud. But there's no hope for him. He's always going to be a pig. But you and I have got a, now a new conscience, a new cleansed conscience. It's like a clean palate, if you will, of our thinking process. And now we have this new relationship with Christ Jesus. Powerful. So in order to understand that, I thought we'd give you a title to the message. And it's called The Workings of a Clean Conscience. And how the clean conscience works in your life so that you can adapt to it. First of all, let me just share a couple of verses with you. Let's take a look at what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse number 17. Let me put it up on the overhead for you. Watch this. And he says these words about you and I. Therefore, I love this. Highlight, John, if you word the word if. Biggest little word in the Bible. If... Anyone. That means anyone. That means you. That means me. That means them in the back row. That means you in the front row. That means the guy in the parking lot, the guy out in the foyer right now. Anyone, the guy in the restaurant, the girl over there, whatever. Anyone means anyone. If anyone, listen to this, is in Christ, there's a new thing taking place. He is a new creation and a new creature, if you will. In other words... I'm, I'm new. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Now, if God's going to clean me up, he's not only going to clean me up, wash the sins away from my old nature, but he's also going to clean up my thinking. If he doesn't give me an opportunity to get my thinking cleaned up, then I'm going to act like the pig and run back to the mud. Follow me? And here the scripture says, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And then the Bible tells us something very fascinating in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 22. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 22, it says, And you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man. In other words, if there's an old man that I'm to put off, there must be a new man I'm going to take on. In other words, I may still be the pig, but there's something happening on the inside of me. I'm taking the old man that operated like the pig, and now I'm putting something on the inside so I don't have to operate like the pig any longer. So he says, put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. In other words, have you ever seen people that just get worse and worse and worse and worse? In fact, if you know old people, a lot of times old people have issues they never dealt with with things of God. They actually become crankier and uglier as they get old. 
Now watch yourself when you say amen. <laughs> and, and, and verse 22 says, verse 23 comes along and says, and be renewed. In other words, I'm getting rid of the old man because there's a new man now I can live in through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And but I not only am in this new man, I have to have it renewed in the spirit of my what? I have to have it renewed in the spirit of my what? Mind. My mind. That's where my conscience, that's where my senses are that I can discern now between the good and the evil. I used to always just simply follow what I did naturally. The natural man, the human part of me. Now there's something new taking place. Verse number 24. And that you put on the new man, which is created according to God, true righteousness and holiness. So I can take off one, put on another. Now, can I ask you something? If God tells you to do that, you should be able to do that. God didn't tell you to do something you can't do. Now, stop thinking about God. He's not sitting in the heavens saying, I told them to take off the old man. They can't do it. They're those stupid little pigs. You'll never be anything else but that. And, and I told them to put on the new bed. There's no new bed for you because people never change. Have you ever heard that in the world? People never change. And it's true. Without God, there is never a change. But with God, this is all about change. So someone comes along and says, well, well, man, uh, I don't quite get it. Well, let me give you a, a definition of something that's very important for you to see when we're talking about this subject called consciousness. Nature is inherited and influences the character of man. But character is developed by the choices we make that should influence the nature of man. The only way that happens is in God. Let me put it up and let's, let's think about it just for a moment. Watch this. Nature is inherited. I am what I am. My natural man is a sinful man. In fact, the first things your kids ever learned was the word no. Why? Because they were always getting into stuff, doing stuff they shouldn't do. Why? Sinful nature. And so the natural sinful man is passed on from generation to generation. And that's the natural man. Nature is inherited. But the nature is influenced. Listen to this. And, and the nature influences the very character of man. Now what's the character of man? The character is the expressions of man. How he does things, how he reacts, how he talks, how he thinks. His character is how he deals in business, deals with his wife. The character issues, how he deals with his children, how he deals with his neighbor. All those issues. Now watch this. So he comes along and says this nature that you inherited influences the character of man. But it shouldn't be that way. But the character is developed by choices. Now, if character is developed by choices, and I can't make choices then I'm the pig that's going to run back to the mud because the pig runs back to the mud no matter how much you clean them up because they can't make choices now watch this but if my character the way I determine things the way I live in things are developed by my choices then I have to have a free will choice to choose stuff and that's where a clean conscience comes in so it's developed by the choices that we make and should influence the natural man the only way that works my friends is with God that's why we say it over and over again people in the world don't change no they don't but people in God have got to change. And when people come to you and say, I am born this way, you can say, hey, all of us are born sinners. And we all change. That's what the cross is all about. Is anybody listening? Now, with that in mind, I want to give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. May I? Yes. Let me try that question again. With that in mind, and I'm going to keep that up. Is that okay we keep that up? Yes. Uh, I, I'm going to give you an illustration of what we're talking about. Well, uh, a couple of three months ago, we 
Deborah and I for a couple of our projects, a couple of our job sites. We went ahead and went down to Los Angeles. And there at Gardena, went to a giant, great, and famous tile factory. And we ordered some really special tile. If you were to buy this tile, it would, who knows what it would cost per square foot. Had them picked it out, went through the whole thing, had them make tile up for us. Waited months for it to find be completed when I got a phone call that said, hey, the tile is ready. Come and pick it up. And I said, well, I, you know, I don't have the ability to pick that up. Don't have the trucks and the forklifts to get them off the truck for, and the job sites. I said, so I have to hire a carrier that's going to pick it up and then deliver it to the job sites. They said, fine. They gave me the name of character, a carrier I could do it. I never done business with these people before. Now, it's like Tuesday or something of last week. And uh, I call, and when I call, the guy asked me some questions. He says, well, how much are you going to be needing to be picked up? I said, 13 pallet loads of tile. Not, not 13 boxes of tile. You know what a pallet is? 13 pallets. We're talking about thousands and thousands of pounds of tile. In the meantime, there's tile guys waiting to go to work. Everybody's waiting to feed their family, get a check, pay their bills, eat, you know, buy their groceries, just like you and everything. So I'm real conscious about that. So I call the guy that's the delivery truck. And the guy's kind of flippant with me. And he's kind of, can I just say it like this? He's kind of rude. But, you know, I'm a Christian. I'll put up with it. And uh, I let him, and he, you know, I said, don't you want my name? He said, no, no, I, I'll take care of that at the place. i like, do you want my telephone number? Do you want, no, no. He said, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait This is not working. I need to know if you're picking up. He says, oh, yes, we'll pick it up first thing in the morning, and we'll deliver it to you around noon. And I said, I don't need any more than that. He says, no. I said, okay. Then I got the phone, told Debbie. I said, something wrong here. I just feel uncomfortable. You know, it just doesn't happen. Well, sure enough, they didn't pick it up first thing in the morning. And it didn't get delivered by noon. So I called back. Because they people standing around waiting for this, you know, 13 pallet loads of, of tiles so they go to work. And I, 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 just, I just, you know, called. They said, listen, did you pick it up? They said, pick what up? I'm, I, can I just say something? Maybe some of the men can understand me. Girl, girls, you already are out of it. But uh, us, us guys are a little bit, you know, we're, we're kind of like, oh, oh, what do you mean, pick what up? I called yesterday. I know your voice. You were the one I talked to. Did you pick it up? He says, oh, no, let me check into that. I thought, okay, well, let's find out where it is. And he said, oh, the truck won't be there until this afternoon. We'll be there at 2 or 3 in the afternoon. I thought, okay, he's picking up Gardena, picking up the truck, a couple hours, around noon, he'll be out at 2, 3, 4 o'clock, something like that. I told the job site guys, I said, hey, they'll be here at 4, get ready, here's a check for them when they deliver, and uh, I got to go to work, come in here. And so here's what happened. I go home 5 o'clock, there's no tile. I get on the phone, call the guy, the guy tells me, he says these words, what tile? <laughs> what do you mean, what tile? Get off the phone with him, call, did they pick up my tile? Here's the funny thing. The guy says, yep. And I'm saying, I call him back. The tile, do you know the tile you picked up? The, they told me down at the factory you picked it up. 13 pallets. How, when, you don't know where 13 pallets are at? <laughs> now I can get real ugly, can you tell? <laughs> and I know all those high school words. <laughs> And I know how to put them in syllables, as I'm talking about, which you learn too. You know that. So I'm kind of like getting there. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not on simmer now. I'm, on, I'm percolating a little bit. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know where 13 pallets are? Well, I don't know anything about it. He says, well, we'll have it. Uh, uh, can't get it to you today. It's past five. I said, why didn't you call me if you couldn't get it today? There are people standing around. Why didn't you call me? I started getting all upset. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God fell on me. He says, calm down. My conscience now is realizing I was going someplace where I shouldn't go. And I was being motivated by my natural man, the old man. 
to open the mouth and start expressing things I shouldn't express. And all of a sudden, it catches me. The guy says, we'll be there first thing in the morning. I said, fine, now it's Friday. He's done this a couple of times. He, Friday comes around, there's no truckload. I call him back. Where's the 13 pallets? He says, what 13 pallets? What are you talking about? This is the first I ever heard of it. <laughs> My natural man up there is now persuading and influencing my character. And my character desperately wants to go back to the high school words. <laughs> now, let me show you what that would sound like, just to show you that I have the ability to, what do you mean, you stupid idiot? I've talked to you every single day, and you told me what you wanted. What's the matter with you? You crazy or something like that? I can't even understand you, but let me talk to your boss. I am sick and tired of talking to you. You don't even know what you're doing. You shouldn't even get a paycheck. You so beep, 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 and then on. Uh... Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You know? So he says, it's missing. I'm thinking to myself, what a week. Planes are missing, trucks are missing, everything's missing. Like, like is there some UFO invasion here? Where did this, where, where did this 13 pounds, how do you miss 13 pounds? <laughs> no, that's cool. So I had to have my character now influence my nature instead of my nature influencing my character. I couldn't let the old man rule a new man expression. The new man had to kick the old man out. And so I said, okay, when are you going to uh, deliver it? He says, well, we gotta find it first. Probably won't be today. Maybe Monday. The word maybe took me back to my old nature. <laughs> Got off the phone finally, said Monday they'll deliver. God spoke to me and said, all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord, called according to his purpose. This is not your job site, but mine. This is not your business, but mine. You're my servant. Serve me. Don't serve your flesh, old man. Got off, remembered Wednesday night's meeting about when you've lost your peace, what to do. I did the four steps. Within 10 minutes, I'm laughing. Debbie and I both start laughing. We're having a ball. We're laughing so hard. We said, tonight, when we get home, let's eat a big bowl of popcorn and we'll rent that movie, you know, a uh, 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 money pit. <laughs> And sure enough, we got the big, you remember that old movie with Tom Hanks? Got the big thing of popcorn, put on money, and we laughed, and we laughed, and we laughed. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, is how the new character, because my mind, soul, now influences the old nature, which is ugly and full of sin. Is anybody listening? Okay. I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to finish this in seven minutes. I'm gonna give you some things that are very important for you to see. A clean conscience does three things for you and I that you can write down in the next seven minutes and believe me, I'm gonna finish it in seven minutes. Number one, a clean conscience gives us the ability to choose. Where we never had a choice before, we were the pig that only knew what was comfortable to our old and our flesh and our nature and natural man. Now I have a choice. I can either choose to go that way or choose to go this way. Never had that choice before. In Acts the 24th chapter, it's really interesting, there's this comment that's being made. In Acts the 24th chapter, I'll pop it up for you. This being so, I myself, listen to these words, strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and man. I want you to zero in on the word strive. 
I now have a choice. I can either strive at this. I can work at this. I can let the things bother me. I can get ugly. I can get, I can yell. I can scream. I can give up. I can quit. I can be frustrated. I can be mad. I can be angry. I can be ugly. And I'm justified and I'm right. No doubt about it. I'm right. Or I can strive to lot. See, because if I had blown it that day, my conscience without an offense would have been, with an offense, would have been offensive to God and to man that day. And now all of a sudden I'm no longer serving the Lord. But I'm serving the old nature flesh. Is anybody listening to me? Now watch this. So it's important to understand that with a clear, clean conscience, we can now have options. And we can make choices. Number two, a clean conscience. Write this down. This is a good one. Checks us. I need something to check me all the time. So when I'm off base, I get back online. I need something to come along and, and, and a conscience. To, have you, has anybody ever sinned? And then you felt to yourself, oh, I feel so dirty. Wait a minute, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Let me give it to you like this. You are a Christian. You went out. You got bombed on Saturday night. You ended up, you, you know, you did the... <laughs> In my day, it was a mashed potato. <laughs> Who can, I mean, how innocent was our age? Do the mashed potato. I mean, they don't do that. Whoever sings about mashed potatoes? So, uh, you know, you got drunk. You're about there dancing, doing all the stuff. You wake up somewhere you shouldn't. Don't raise your hand. Don't even smile. Look forward as if you don't know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And a conscience sets something off in your heart. Like, oh my God, I'm wrong. I've done something wrong. And you will know when you've done something wrong. It checks you. I like what the writer says. If I could just get this popped up in, in, uh, in Romans, the ninth chapter, verse number one. And it says it like this, words. It says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. And wait a minute, is, is this... Paul the Apostle that's writing this? Can I just say something? I never thought Paul would write lie, writing scripture. I mean, stop thinking about this. This is Paul the Apostle who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he starts off with, I tell the truth. Paul, I hope you're telling the truth. My life is at stake here. And you're not lying? I hope you're not lying. But then he comes along and makes this day. My conscience also bears me witness. One of the neat things is not only do you have options and you know you have choices you can make now, but you also have inside of you a conscience that'll check you out, make sure you're right with God, bear witness, and it's the Holy Spirit that tells you. When you know that you know that you know you're doing something wrong, you know it. You hate people to tell you, because then you come along and say, I don't know, I'm just doing it to anybody else. Have you, ever, have you ever said to the kids, you shouldn't do that? And they say, why not? I haven't done anything wrong. And they haven't done anything wrong in their conscience. But the parent guides them that you know it's wrong. That's the wrong person to hang around. Why not? They haven't done anything wrong. It's not about whether they've done anything wrong. You just know that's the wrong person to hang around. And there's a checking of the Spirit of God on the inside. The third thing really important for us to see is a clean conscience will keep us attached to God. I don't know about you, but... Attached to God is very important. Without a clean conscience, I start doubting my relationship with God. Without a clean conscience, when I pray, I'm not sure I'm going to get answers. But with a clean conscience, I say, wow, I'm right with God. I'm going to get answers from God. And an interesting verse comes along that's so powerful. Let's take a look at it. 1 Timothy 
And verse number 18 of the first chapter says, I charge, I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously uh, made concerning you, that by them you might wage a good warfare. So here's Paul writing to Timothy saying, I want you to wage a good warfare. In other words, for all of us, that's the desire of God. You're in a war, let's wage a good warfare. Someone says, well, how do I fight that fight? You're going to fight it with something very obvious, faith. But notice the next verse. There's something else attached. Having faith and a good conscience. Because if I don't have a good conscience towards what I'm doing, because, oh, listen to this. I'm not attached to God because of my conscience. I won't ever keep the faith in there. A good conscience keeps your faith attached to what you're believing that changes your future. Is anybody listening? Guy, did you get that? A good conscience keeps your faith attached to God so that you can believe for the future. Without a good conscience, you're going to have faith, but as soon as the pressure comes, you're not going to make it. Today, a clean conscience does three things. It gives us the ability to choose. It checks us. and will keep us attached to God. The sense of right and wrong. Let me just pop up Hebrews, if I may. Now watch how the verse becomes alive. The ninth chapter, verse 14. He offers himself up uh, without spot to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works. You know what the dead works are? Doing what you want and what you think instead of what God wants and what God thinks. When you do life... Well, listen, listen, listen. When you do life... God's way, you prosper. When you do life your way, according to your natural man, you just keep doing life and you don't get anywhere. But if you do life God's way, and what helps you to do that is a clean conscience. From dead works to serve in other words, serve doesn't mean just getting in, cleaning the carpets of the church and being a witness, but simply having a heart attached to God. I'm a servant of God because I live His way. And that's the best thing you can do. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't that good? good. I just want to make sure everybody's right with God before you go. Everybody remain seated, and let's just take a moment, check your heart, see if you're right with God, then I'll let you go. Let the ushers finish their job. Don't let anything disturb you, because God wants to ask you a question right now. If you were to walk out of this place today, and your heart stopped and you died, would you go to heaven, or would you go to hell? That's the question. If you died in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Let's talk about it just for a moment. You know, the Bible says that you need to check yourself out from time to time. Make sure you're right with God. So let's say you answered that. Hopefully you did. Why did you say what you said? Some people think they're going to heaven because they're really good. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? Some people say, hey, I'm going to heaven because uh, I love God. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your mom and dad could take you to catechism class, Sunday school class, Sabbath school class, have you christened or baptized as a baby? That gets you in heaven. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. It won't get you to heaven. And somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. Jesus makes a statement. He says, here's how you get to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way but his way. You can't get there my way. We can't get there your way. We can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven. It's his heaven. You're going to have to get there his way. And he tells us in John 3rd chapter these words. You must be born again. Born again, a lot of people don't understand what it means. You know, a lot of people think born again people are idiots and weirdos and fanatics and crazy people, but here's what born again means. Somebody should explain it to you. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what born again means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. 
You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. Always has been all or nothing. God forgive us in American churches, we've watered that down. It's an all or nothing relationship, I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. You've heard of the book of Revelation, I know you have. Jesus is speaking in the book of Revelation. He makes this statement. He says, when I come again, and you know he is. He says, when I come again, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, bang, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. That's a crude and rude statement Jesus himself just made. Can't even imagine this loving God making a statement that he would vomit you from his mouth or vomit me from his mouth but only if we're lukewarm let me define for you what lukewarm is it's a little in a little out it's a little up it's a little down it's a token prayer every now and then occasional church attendance you know God is something in your life but he's not everything Watch this. Here's lukewarm. Again, he, he, God is uh, uh, in your life, but he's not all your life. He's just something in your life. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. And God is telling you today how much he loves you. That he made a plan so that you could be successful. And none of it will work until you are right with God. So somebody... Listen to me for a moment. Needs to love you enough and respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. Stop playing games. If you want games, there's a lot of places you can go to get the games. But I'm not gonna play games with you. I'm gonna tell you like it is. You need to be born again. And the only way to be born again is you gotta give God all of your heart. You gotta give God all of your life. You know why you got to give it to him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to make you do it. He's not a con He could hit you in the head with a two-by-four long enough until you do say it. Or he could have made a billion robots that look just like you to worship him and sing to him. But he didn't. He gave you a free will choice. Now, what will you do with it? Will you choose him or not choose him? It's your call and your choice. Went to the cross, died for you, beaten bloody mess because he loves you. He opened up the way to heaven for you. Now, will you choose it or will you choose your own way? It's your call. That's what this is all about. But in order to choose him, you're going to have to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But he goes on to say these words, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. What I mean by that is you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. You celebrate Christmas, you celebrate Easter, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Having Jesus in your head, the proof of that is the devil knows who he is and he's not going to heaven. And it's not about what you have. Look at me, look at me, look at me. It's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? You know whether you have or not. Today is your day of salvation. And when I pop my hands together, bang, your hand goes up. Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. It is your call. It is your choice. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two. Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. Back over here. There's four. Thank you. God bless you. There's five. There's six. Thank you. Back here. There's seven. Eight. Thank you. There's nine. Thank you. 
there's 10 right there. God bless you. Anybody else? There's 10 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. You know you need to get your hand up. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. But it's time for you to make the choice. Are you going for God or not? There's 10 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. There's 11. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, come on, come on. Don't miss this. Back in that family room. Anybody else? Packed family room. Back in that family room. Packed family room. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another one. 12. Thank you. God bless you. There's 13. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 13 wise people. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 13 wise people. Now, here's what I want you to do. All 13 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. All, nobody leave during this. Listen to me. Listen, listen. You're not listening. Nobody leave during this period of time because we're working getting people to come forward and give God their heart. And you walk out the back door, they might just follow you right out. All 13 of you that raised your hand and anybody that should have raised your hand but you didn't. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to, but get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. No weird stuff goes on. We're going to pray together, and we're going to need God. So you come right now. Get out of your seat and get up here right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Here's my friend Antonio right over here. Antonio is going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff to take home. You know, like, answer this question. Now that you're a Christian, what does God want from you? Well, that little free stuff that we're going to give you that you can read about, it'll tell you what to do next. You're going to be a Christian, what to do. And then he'll introduce you to a program called Spiritual Personal Trainer so you understand. These are friends like the people behind you right now. They want to hook up with you. They want to meet you before church service. They want to help you understand who you are in Jesus. Let Listen to me. Listen. Let the church, let us help you get strong in Jesus. If not, you're going to end up right back where you were before. We don't want you to fall through the cracks. We want you to be victorious in the things of God. Let us help you. That's what we're asking for. So make a left turn. Follow Antonio right over that way. Come on, let's give them a great big hand. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. 
Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.